Progressive brings you Flowetry with Flow. When Flow flows, she flows in the know. Mind ruminates the rates. Show them all, I heed the call. Seeing the rest, I choose the best. Sometimes it's ours, sometimes it's not. When the fox walks, is it called a fox trot? That's a real question. Compare Progressive Direct rates with competitors' rates. Visit Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Blog Talk Radio. Gentlemen, welcome to the Voice of the People. It's August 28, 2017. It's your man, the six man Dean Geronimo, and I'm here in the studio. And I believe my man Mark is riding with me. Mark, what's going on with you, brother? Not much. Just sitting here chilling in the big city of uh, Durham, you know, the Bull City. Calling y'all this. The lovely Haytown Area Center. Letting folks know that uh, we got dance class going on over here. And uh, I'm looking outside. It looks like the flood of rain is going on, too. But, you know, at least we are not Houston, Texas. Because Houston, Texas got hit real hard. And I got friends from that part of the world. So who knows? We might even hear from Danny if I can find a way to reach out to him. And uh, maybe he'll tell us what's going on if I can find a way to reach him. And if he's available to give us a play, play by play, blow by blow of what's going on. But we do know that they've been hit real hard. Wow, man. Prayers go out to all those down there in that area that has been affected by the storm. It's also uh, the anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, if I'm not mistaken. So this time of year is not too favorable for that area, man. Yeah, not favorable at all. You're right. Uh, I was actually talking about that with one of my uh, other coworkers earlier, and we were trying to figure out whether this was the – 10th anniversary or which anniversary it was of Katrina, but you were right. I do believe that this was around that same time, but Hurricane Harvey is going through causing all kinds of damage and things of that nature. So we're just going to have to find out uh, how people uh, weather this storm and uh, hopefully, uh, like you said, a lot of devastation. I'm sure there's been a lot of uh, casualties and things of that nature. So our prayers definitely continue to go out to those people. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of organizations are going and doing their part to help them out, I'm sure that the Red Cross is definitely mobilized. Samantha's Purse is mobilized. A lot of the other rescue organizations are out there mobilizing. So if you're listening and you're able to give support and aid to folks that are in this kind of uh, need, we definitely urge you to do the same as well. You know, uh, changing the topic, but not totally changing the topic, Floyd and Connor just made a whole lot of money. So I think that they need to go ahead and give some of that money to the folks over there that are in desperate need because, I mean, they just made a – boatload of money. I did not watch the fight because uh, we went up to Henderson, me and the other folks, to do the uh, Road to the Apollo show and uh, had a good time up there. The Sandman got a little bit of a workout. He got to uh, chase off about <laughs> four acts. Uh, apparently, they don't like oh, uh, wow. hip hop guys in, uh, in Henderson, in Henderson, North Carolina, because all I think everybody that tried to do a little hip hop got booed off the stage and they got one singer. So uh, they were not too pleased <laughs> with uh, what was going on. But we stopped by a, a club, a restaurant that was in the area, a sports bar, and they were sitting there saying that uh, they were empty because they did not have a lot going on. We had some good food over there, but they didn't have a lot going on. And part of the reason they didn't have a lot going on is because they didn't, weren't willing to pay that amount of money that they charged, apparently, uh, clubs and you get those things. Because apparently, you know, if you do it in your house, it might be about, what, $9,800, something like that. But if you're a venue and they know uh, you're a venue, they want to well, charge you actually, a few thousand dollars. Actually, brother, if you get the Netmaster stream box, it won't cost uh-huh. you anything. Um, oh. You know, I, I I got the Netmaster stream box. We came home. We had just come back from the uh, Arena Bowl football game, the Philadelphia Soul, one back-to-back title. So they, they won Arena Bowl 30. We came home. I turned on the Netmaster, found the fight, stream, flawless, cost me not one cent. So, if anybody's listening out there, you're interested in a, a Netmaster stream box, contact Dean 13 Media. That's D E A N, the number 13, M E D I A, at gmail.com. And it, it is one price for the box, no monthly fees. Man, I can't complain because while some people paid that $100, 
And then some people try to get it on their fire sticks and it wouldn't work. And, and some paid through Netflix and that didn't work. I was at home with my Netmaster stream box watching the entire fight. And then the next day was able to watch the replay just because I could. So, you know, it is very, um, it is very beneficial to have. <laughs> This sport, so I just want to know, as one who watched the fight, I've read about the fight. I haven't even not to see any of the clips of the fight, but I, I read about the fight. I heard that uh, there was a little bit of just toying around with uh, Mr. McGregor in the first round, and then I guess um, they whether decided to get serious. But it sounds like a lot of people think that it wasn't much of a fight, and that uh, you know the results was kind of what they expected. But uh, I was wondering what you thought of the fight and whether it was what you expected. Honestly, you know what it was. I believe that this is all a setup for, because you think about it, Floyd Mayweather, I mean, he's 40 years old. He didn't have a damn thing to prove to anybody to come and fight someone who, number one, had never stepped foot in a professional boxing ring. So I think that he may be venturing into the world of MMA as a promoter, and he would do a much better job than the um, current promoter, you know, those guys don't make a lot of money, and they beat each other half, halfway to death. So if he goes into MMA with, with McGregor as either a fighter or as a partner, I wouldn't be surprised because, I mean, with boxing, if he were to step back in the ring again, that would be almost foolish of him. You, you've, won more, you've won more fights than anyone else in boxing history, so we know you're going to the Boxing Hall of Fame. You have nothing else to do inside of that ring, you know. So go out, take another venture, make some money. You know, that's what I think that setup was for, you know, honestly. <laughs> oh, I think we have a doorbell ringing, and I'm expecting somebody, yeah. but uh, I'll wait yeah. for them and everything because um, I did hear the doorbell ring and all of that. That's fun thing. Um, what did you think about uh, this whole thing with Joe uh, from uh, Mr. Trump decided to pardon and just do crazy things again? Well, in the beginning, um, Sheriff Arpaio changed the game of how some things were done. For instance, out there with the tent city, um, to have all of the offenders wear pink, I mean, from the underwear all the way to the uniforms. And, and he never had a lot of incidents out there, but then again, that scorching heat out there, you're not going to do too much anyway, I don't believe. But then I guess somewhere along the line of doing right, he decided to do something else. And honestly, if he did that something else, then he should pay just like everybody else. He He's not above the law. And unfortunately, with that pardon, that's what it made him believe, you know? That's an interesting thing. And, you know, one of the other interesting things is well, I'm sure we might even get to this with our guest who's on the phone with us very shortly is that, you know, not only are the Confederates going down, but there's a lot of other things that are happening in society. Because I was reading in USA Today, and apparently there's some folks that are using social media because they are upset because Gone with the Wind is about to disappear from a Memphis theater despite a 34-year tradition. And by, uh, it looks like earlier today, opponents were mounting a fiery, a fiery uh, attack through social media to cast shame on the band, claiming that it was uh, racially insensitive. Uh, so, one person, uh, a Fox uh, host, said that Common Sense has gone with the wind in their hometown of Memphis. He claimed that the film had been done in by a bunch of meddling, no-account, liberal Yankee carpetbaggers. So he's already trying to put blame on folks that are not from <laughs> the South and trying to claim that that's the reason. Even though, you know, a lot of people throughout history have talked about the nature of Gone with the Wind, the fact that Gone with the Wind was made during racist times, definitely had some racist overtones. And yet they folks that you know they've seen this film and they've made it into a cult classic in Memphis. So now they're uh, talking about they're upset because it says the Orpheum Theater canceled a long-running screening of Gone with the Wind because of racially insensitive content in the 1939 film, which which won eight Oscars and was based on a Pulitzer Prize-winning 1936 book of the same name. But the film's friends and the Free Expression supporters and Dixie sympathizers are furious about this decision, and they're already uh, shouting out social media, just uh, blaming all of us 
liberals and folks for basically uh, standing up finally and saying, look, you know, just because it's a, uh, been on TV forever and perpetrating all these kind of claims, that y'all need to go ahead and perpetrate these kind of claims. So, you know, when folks decide to stand up, folks get a little bit heated. So it, it even says that we've done complaints for years. It says African Americans have complained about it for years to little effect. But Gone with the Wind always also is the first film in which a black performer, Hattie McDaniels, who played the main character, Scarlett O'Hara, Slave Mammon, won a Best Supporting Actress Oscar. Now, uh, they even brought up the Hollywood Oscars or white problem, saying now with Hollywood Oscars or white problem and the growing visibility of white supremacists posturing in public and online, that uh, Gone with the Wind seems especially toxic to some, including uh, Memphis, and you cannot argue that Memphis has a large African-American population. So I can definitely understand why they have finally got with the times and realized that they might not need to show that film. Um, you said 34 years? 34 years they've been showing this film. 34 years they've been showing that one film. And I, I hate to say it, but some of our films can't even get 34 seconds on a big screen. So... <laughs> It's time to retire that. Yeah, we understand Hattie McDaniel won the award for it. But that was then when they had to fight for any role that they could get. Um, We still have to fight for roles that we get, but, you know, it's time to retire. I'm surprised the tape still works. I'm surprised the film has not burned up. But, hey, you know what? Maybe they got a net master in their stream that too. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you know, but you know, we even got our own brothers, if you want to call them that, that want to come to the defense of what's going on because Herman Cain, yes, your buddy Herman Cain, a former GOP presidential candidate, has declared on his website, "The scrubbing of history continues unabated." Anyone who would like to explain the difference between this and burning books, go ahead. So he's trying to make a parallel between this and burning books. Well, you know what? I think Herman Cain, isn't that the pizza dude? Didn't he have the pizza things a while back, like before he got into politics? Yeah, he was we'll find out. All kinds of we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll find out. But, you know what, I think, you know, each person has their own opinion. Some people sound crazy when they say it. Some people sound like idiots when they say other things. So, you know, I mean, for me, Herman Cain was never anyone that I was going to take any advice from anyway. I mean, the the floor could be about to fall out. He could say, you might want to step to the left. I'm just going to have to fall through the floor, man, because he's not somebody that I would take, you know, anything um, from. But, yeah, he was the like- guy who joined – he joined Pillsbury, became the vice president of that. Um, he was a business executive at Burger King – then the CEO of Godfather's Pizza. He was the pizza dude. All right. Just had to look that up for a second. <laughs> Maybe the sauce got to him. Who knows? But um, we're going we're gonna to get ready to check and see who's behind the door. We don't want him to wait too long. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is the voice of the people. Don't forget to call in and join the conversation at 646-668-8393. Again, 646-668. 8393. And with that being said, welcome to the Voice of the People. Who are we speaking with tonight? Hey there, this is Lone Tran and Eva Pinjuani. Hello. Hey, uh, hey, Dean. Yeah. We are in for a a wonderful treat because these are the actual folks. You know, we talk about it on the show and we've talked about their bravery and things of that nature. But, you know, I went out there, I reached out to them. These are the actual folks that in Durham, North Carolina, took down the Confederate statue. Oh, hey. <laughs> so, Lone and uh, the rest of the people, who else is on the line? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it off. Who else was on the line with you? This is Eva Penjuani from the Defend Durham campaign. Hey, Eva, how are you doing? And we got Lone, we got Eva, and we got other folks involved. We definitely appreciate you. So, yeah, thank you so much for having us on the call tonight. No problem at all. For those that were not that are uh, not from Durham, because like I said, the voice of the people, my uh, co-host when she uh, joins us, Ty is from Hawaii, Dean is from New Jersey, and we get listeners from all over the lovely uh, United States as well as from other parts of the world. 
So, of course, I'm in Durham and part of the um, board of the Durham Solidarity Center and things of that nature, so I know part of what's going on. But a lot of other folks, they've just been reading about it in the newspaper and have no idea, one, why it was done or how it was done. So give us a little bit of the history of so what decided to make folks take the statue down, which has been hanging up there for a while, and a lot of folks who were walking by it and was actually talking to one of my coworkers, and they were sitting there going, like, it's been there forever. I didn't even realize what it was, but... They were not saying that as a positive or negative. They were just kind of like making the statement about how they walk by it all the time. But just wondering if you can give people a little rundown as to what led to the action. Thanks for having us on tonight. Yeah, I mean, you're right. As people who live in Durham or live in the Triangle know that, you know, Durham is not unique in having these um, memorials to the Confederates, uh, the Confederate Army. Sometimes it's for specific generals like um, Robert E. Lee, but for in Durham, the one right next to our county courthouse, our old county courthouse, where our county commissioners meet, and uh, down the block from Black Wall Street, historic Black Wall Street, is a statue in honor of the boys who wore the gray, the Confederate soldiers statue monument. You know, um, in recent weeks, as after this action, there's been people questioning, like, oh, well, who funded this? And you know, when was this put up? But, yeah, for the most part, you know, your average townsperson knows that this has been here forever. Um, that said, the resistance in Durham has also been there for quite a while, too. So, you know, it's important that folks know that this wasn't like, hey, we're bored. Let's take down a statue. It was a uh, political statement about the fact that white supremacy has no place in Durham, North Carolina. Not to say that the statue equals uh, the only problem of, of white supremacy. It's the most visible. It's the tip of the iceberg. And the people in Durham, um, as you know, Mark, and as you're part of this community, um, are very invested in people's power, are very invested in uh, uprooting systems of oppression that, you know, um, is crystallizing the fight against white supremacy. So we wanted to say something, do something in the wake of the events in Charlottesville, Virginia, which happened the weekend before on Saturday, August 12th, um, a woman, Heather Heyer, a counter-protester who was going up to say no to white nationalists, to the KKK, an anti-racist white woman, was actually murdered. Um, now, for those of us in the movement and social justice world, we knew about this, but this actually commanded the national stage. M many people across the country were very affected by this narrative, um, and a little bit scared to recognize that the Trump administration had given leeway and given a stage for, you know, open white supremacist hatred and nationalism to be the rule of law. And also we're, you know, definitely upset that the police in Charlottesville did not do anything to stop, you know, the terror of white nationalists. So like many places in North Carolina, across the South, across the country, we had a vigil and a demonstration where the people of Durham showed up and kind of contextualized what, what, what this moment was, who the enemy was, what the strategy was. And, you know, it, it was a real show of solidarity, a real show of unity. We had, you know, old folks, young folks, uh, people who were rooted in the black community in the Haiti of Durham, people who, are white and um, anti-racists who had gone to Charlottesville as a, and were witnesses and came back. And, you know, the narrative is that, you know, one person was at the crux of this. But the real thing is that um, we allowed the community a choice on what was going to be done about this visual symbol of white supremacy. And the community took a stand and took that statue down. So, you know, lots of conversations about property, about vandalism. But I think for so many people in the movement in Durham, it's really about what's next. It's not just about this hunk of metal. It's about, okay, now we have our eyes on the prize, which is looking at the system of white supremacy. And that is the real threat to the state, the sheriff, the police here. And there has been a political witch hunt and political retribution, um, you know, people – having arrest warrants, showing up at somebody's job, you know, breaking into somebody's house, uh, really trying to rattle us and shake us, uh, not just about what happened that day, but about the fact that we do have our eyes on the prize, that we are more united than ever, 
Um, you know, I, I'm here today um, with the Defend Durham Coalition, which has popped up um, a lot of different folks in solidarity, um, anti-racist activists who know that Durham made the news and are proud that we stood up to white supremacy, that we, you know, sent the Klan home on Friday that that week when they wanted to squat up and show that they were upset. Um, we have people who are calling the DA's office and flooding and saying, drop the charges. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but we are on the ground and we are running. And um, again, thank you so much for inviting me here to talk a little bit about the work that we're up to. Oh, no problem at all. Glad to have you on the show and definitely glad to let folks from around the uh, country uh, learn about what's happening, not just uh, here in Durham, but throughout the country. Actually, last week we had a uh, caller call us from um, Oklahoma, um, the Tulsa area, because they were going through some similar kind of things with their uh, society, not just with the African-American community, but also with the uh, Native American community. And uh, they have now become a uh, regular listener as well. So hopefully they may call in and give us a little bit more insight as they learn more about what's going on in Durham. But they definitely gave us a lot of uh, insight as to the parallels. And, of course, we've heard of parallels and things going on, not just here in Durham, but I believe there were some actions taken in um, places that people even know to be also a little bit on the uh, racist side, even though they may be northern, because there have been actions in Boston and other places that have a little bit of uh, racial tension and racial history as well, even though people try to differentiate between what happens in the south and what happens in the north, but systematic racism actually exists throughout the United States, and that rise of uh, nationalism is definitely, we're seeing that particularly with this administration, but it's existed in other administrations as well. So, uh, one of the uh, things that I'm sure that people would be wanted to know is you mentioned it earlier, but I know that it's one of the earlier posts that I saw on Facebook was some of our uh, leadership folks have actually had people come into their houses um, in terms of local law enforcement and seem to be fascinated by some of the uh, literature that they have and want to make assumptions about what their politics are or how radical they are based on what, their, uh, what they have in their collection of uh, books and or um, – newspapers and things of that nature. I remember that uh, one of the leaders of the Durham Solidarity Center, I believe there was a book on Malcolm X and some other things that were in their collection that they wound up having pictures taken of. So um, I think folks are learning a lot about um, how deep the repression can go and things of that nature. So I just wondered if you could tell a little bit about after the uh, statue was taken down, what some of those things that happened in the as a response from law enforcement and from uh, even some of the people out of the uh, alt-right, if that's what they want to call themselves, because there have been uh, threats placed on people and things of that nature. So and we're definitely trying to keep an eye on uh, people and ways to keep safe and things of that nature. So if you can just let folks know what, the, what some of the reactions have been. Totally. Um, and, again, this is loan from uh, Workers World Party, uh, the Durham branch, um, I think that uh, we are, you know, the response that we're receiving from law enforcement um, and, uh, you know, um, the white supremacists and neo-Nazis and, and vigilantes on the right um, is, uh, you know, in some ways really um, expected um, when there, wherever and whenever there is resistance, there is bound to be repression um, because, as Eva mentioned earlier, we are showing right to our communities and also to the state and to the police and to the sheriff's department um, that we're much stronger together. Um, and so at this point, um, there have been um, eight folks um, arrested um, who are facing several charges. Um, and actually, um, you know, as I'm speaking now, folks are preparing to do jail support at the downtown jail because the sheriff's department has um, issued three more arrest warrants um, for folks allegedly um, who are a part of Monday's action. Um, and they're really doing this to intimidate people and to instill fear in people and to try to isolate people, um, trying to strike up panic and paranoia so that folks um, are immobilized and, and don't get organized. But we know that these are classic 
classic, classic tactics um, when we're dealing with a white supremacist state. Um, and we saw that, you know, we saw that with COINTELPRO um, in the Black Liberation Movement and Civil Rights Movement of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We've seen that throughout history with the anti-war movement. Um, and we've seen that very recently with the, the Black Lives Matter movement that sparked up after the police murder of Mike Brown, um, that they will target and come after organizers and leaders within our communities. And we believe that our strongest defense is solidarity and, and unity um, and raising up um, the message that we're not going to stop until we smash white supremacy. Folks are clearly not going to stop until every statue that commemorates, um, you know, uh, the Confederacy and com commemorates white supremacy and racism comes down. Um, and so in terms of, you know, what folks are doing um, to keep safe, I think it's continuing to organize and convene as a community and lean in on each other and really identify um, the reality that um, very often um, our law enforcement, um, whether they work in direct collaboration or not, um, are carrying out, um, you know, the, the agenda and the ideology of, of white supremacists. Um, and so we're prepared um, to continue to organize and mobilize folks. Um, and um, I will actually have to um, hop off of here shortly because we are, again, going to the jail soon for folks who are turning themselves in. Um, but, you know, one thing that we want to make sure that the Sheriff's Department knows here is that um, we're not going to be um, scared into submission. Yeah, definitely not. And one of the things that I've been really proud about in Durham, I mean, it's existed in the past, but uh, I think we're even seeing it more with what's going on this time around in terms of fighting against uh, the different kinds of uh, repressions that exist out there is that there seems to be a lot of unity among folks. And I know that one of the tactics that folks have used for years is trying to divide people. So they try to, like, you know, turn people that are black against white, um, the uh, LGBT community against the religious community, and um, the different classes, like poor against uh, middle class and things of that nature. But from what I'm seeing both in the uh, big rallies that was held uh, after the statue was taken down on that Friday and everything, and what I've seen on other uh, actions as well, is that there's definitely um, unity across the board, that the folks are not going to play the whole divide and conquer kind of game that a lot of times folks like to try to get folks involved in because we all realize that the struggle is a struggle that incorporates a lot of different kind of people and a lot of different kind of struggles that exist out there. Because, I mean, a lot of they will try to divide people, try to make um, not even fair parallels between like the civil rights struggle and the LGBT struggle and things of that nature as a dividing tactic. But a lot of times we don't seem to be wanting to fall into that game, which is a good thing. And I'm just wondering if um, y'all were seeing that same kind of, uh, noticing that same kind of habit that a lot of folks are being, one, that they're trying to do that division, and two, that a lot of folks are recognizing the errors of the past and not falling into that division as quickly. Totally, yeah. I think that um, especially in moments like this when um, things are uh, intensifying at such a rapid rate in North Carolina and also across the South that, um, you know, one of the things that we're really a firm believer in is that the struggle changes our consciousness, right? Uh, when we are able to witness for ourselves exactly what it's going to take in order to tear down all of these systems of oppression, whether it be white supremacy or capitalism or sexism or homophobia, that it's really going to take all of us. And ultimately, at the end of the day, um, and it may sound cliche, but I think politically it is very true and it has been true for what we've seen here in Durham in terms of folks coming out and supporting each other, is that we have a lot more in common than we are led to believe. Um, that ultimately at the end of the day, um, there are um, two sides. Uh, there is the side of, of white supremacy and oppression um, and capitalism and exploitation, and then there's the side of, of our folks, right, who are fighting for freedom and justice and liberation. Um, and while there may be some moments that are very challenging or heartbreaking um, to deal with, we know that our side, the side of freedom fighters, um, historically and currently and well into the future will, will you know, be, be weighted much heavier, will be much stronger so long as we come together. Um, I think that there is always a, a current, right, of folks who do want to um, divide and, 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 and conquer and draw wedges, um, but we know that um, at the end of the day um, that, 
um, it's much more important for us to come together and build this fight together because we're facing a common enemy um, for, for LGBTQ folks, for black and brown people, for immigrants, um, undocumented folks, for women, for working class and poor people, for disabled people. Um, we're facing a, a, a state and a government that um, is really re repressive and harmful and does not have the interests of, of our communities in mind and have more of the interests of, of you know, politicians and, and profiteers who are running these big banks and these big corporations and could really care less, right, um, whether or not people are able to survive their, their day to day. Yeah, definitely. For those that are not that familiar, of course, I know you that very well from having been involved with the Solidarity Center and seeing you being uh, very active in the struggles that we're having and everything. For those that are new to hearing about you, uh, give a little folks a little history as to how you got into activism and things of that nature, because, like I said, I know a little bit of the story, but other folks like Dean and others that are listening might be sitting there going, like, well, how did this person get into activism? So if you just kind of, like, back, we'll backtrack a little bit and we'll give folks a little bit of a story as to how you got involved and uh, how you became the activist that you are. Sure. Yeah, totally, Mark. And then um, I'll definitely have to hop off after this question, um, but I'm happy to share that. Um, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, after my family migrated here from Vietnam. Um, and I, beca I became an organizer in high school, um, first through the migrant justice movement. I had a lot of friends who um, are undocumented and, and were facing a lot of challenges thinking about what they would do after high school, because North Carolina is one of those states where if you are undocumented, you have to pay out-of-state tuition. Um, and there's not financial aid that exists out there for undocumented students. There are very few scholarships available. Um, and so that was really where I, I entered into the fight. Um, and a lot of my personal experiences growing up shaped, shaped why I decided, you know, that, that my life's work is to fight for, for revolution and to fight for radical change in our society. Um, my family struggled um, with incarceration. Um, we lost our home uh, when I was in middle school um, around the, the housing crisis. And so there are all of these things in my personal life that I was starting to draw connections to in the outside world and meeting other people who are going through similar things and feeling really less alone and then starting to think, okay, now that I feel less alone, what are we going to do about it? Um, and so I uh, started organizing in high school, um, became um, really involved in my local community um, and um, have just been connecting with really amazing folks since. And um, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do without um, others in my community who have also made a really clear decision that, um, they were going to fight for the kind of future that we all deserve. No doubt, and I mean, that's one of the things that I definitely admire about you is that uh, even getting involved at the uh, time that you did, you have definitely been a leader in the uh, forefront in terms of all of the struggles that have been going on and oftentimes yourself in uh, both uh, leadership roles and all sorts, both them leading actions to being a speaker to uh, just doing even some of the planning of things that are going on. So I have always been an admirer of yours and continue to be an admirer of yours. So just wanted to let you know that. And we've got folks on that uh, I definitely have seen the work that you are doing and continue to do. So definitely uh, appreciate it and uh, know that even though it's a hard struggle, that it is one that uh, you are definitely uh, doing in uh, quite a uh, wonderful way. And uh, we're definitely proud of you, those of us that have been involved in the movement for years. My folks haven't been involved when I was a uh, teenager in the uh, 70s, so you were continuing a uh, tradition that has been going on for many years and that many folks are seeing in the community. So I know that I'm not the only senior leadership around this area that is definitely seeing the work that you're doing and is quite proud of uh, the work that are going on. Dean? Yep. yep, I'm still here. Cool. I, th yeah, so I think we, we still, I think we still have them on. I think they're still on the line. I'm not sure. Okay. Are you, you still on the line or did you have to get off? I'm getting ready to head off now, but just wanted to say thanks again for having me. Oh, yeah. Most welcome. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks, y'all. Take care. Yes, and we some perception of what was going on and things of that nature, but we definitely appreciate it. What's up, bro? You heard it, but I'm going to try to get another friend of mine that uh, has been involved in some stuff and see if they can call well, in very soon. Okay. 
guys on another phone. But as you can see, we've got folks that are definitely still. Oh, there's another phone call. Yeah, we got another phone call. Let's see who it is. You know what I mean? Welcome to the Voice of the People. Who we speaking with? Um, how you doing, brothers? My name is Tahaka Amana L. Bay. All right, my brother. Good evening. Good evening to y'all. I was just sitting here listening to y'all and um, listening to the uh, young lady. Uh, mm-hmm. We we are involved in um, um, being active as well, but my approach is a little bit different. Now here I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. And uh, what we do is we take the youth and we show them the latest formulas that we have, and we also teach them how to grow their own food, how to have the correct soil, how to uh, uh, approach the system that they are uh, being shrouded by, by identifying exactly what it is, where its origin is, uh, identifying okay. all the markers, all the labels, and opening it, opening it completely up and getting them to understand that, number one, according to our new research, uh, we deal with this thing. Uh, when it, when it, most, I'll put it to you this way. Most people, um, it's easy for them to say um, we need to look at history. Right. Uh, but uh, what we fail to r- realize is when, you, when you're saying history and history and history, we are saying that is his story. But then the next question will have to be, uh, who and what type of system are you talking about? And how big mm-hmm. is this thing? So if we are dealing with uh, racism based on his story all the way back, as far back as you can go, way beyond, uh, uh, right along at the same time of, of, of Egypt, and then you, on the other hand, you have our story. So we got two different things. And scientists <laughs> will tell you that children, uh, they are uh, uh, of African descent, they exhibit uh, certain types of behavior uh, at a very young age. However, by the time they reach age seven, things start going downhill. Well, we have to remember, we just use common sense. Uh, uh, the average child, uh, and I can only speak from the ch- children that look like me because this is the, these are the people uh, that I'm in close contact with. These are the people that we're training. These are the people that we are educating and, and teaching. Mm-hmm. That is when they are going to a school system. Now, when they get into the school system, we have to understand that the racism and the global system of white supremacy is global. This thing is global. This is not just confined to the United States. This thing is global. And they control the nine major points of lives of people, especially in the United States, under the following labels, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. These are the nine points of the global system of racism, white supremacy. So if we get his story lined up and we go all the way back uh, to his origins, what we are looking for is his behavioral patterns, regardless of who he say he is. And then we deal with our story and we go back and our ancient times, and we look at our behavioral patterns, and then we see how they are manifesting themselves in the 20th, 20th century. Now, there are certain pieces of this puzzle that is missing, and one of the biggest pieces of this puzzle, and we teach the children this, is our ancient story in the West, in this hemisphere. And what we are mm-hmm. attempting to do is most, most of the time we are talking about uh, what happened in Africa, or, or, or the slave trade, and uh, uh, what happened in Egypt. And this is very, very important. But what about over here? And there's a, there's a, a wonderful gentleman, I don't know if you guys ever read the book, uh, but his name is uh, Horace Butler. He wrote a book called 
when rocks cry out. And he dealt specifically with our ancient story in this hemisphere. The ancient maps of the United States and South America is missing. How can we have a place called America when we had natives here right. prior to it being invaded? So what was the name of the place before then? What is the name of the maps? What is the name of the territories, the towns, the cities, the states? How could we have Australia? What was the name of the land prior to it being invaded and the label Australia put on it? You you understand the type of teaching that I'm talking about, brother? Yeah, I definitely. Do. Okay, but I just, that's, I just wanted to um, put that uh, little bit of information out there. So it's something that we have to consider because if you do not recognize and turn over all the rocks, you have missing pieces. If the United States filed Chapter 11 in bankruptcy in 1933 uh, and is operating as a corporation, and the only thing a corporation can do business with is another corporation, then uh, that would explain why on every bill and every document you got, including your bank statement, driver's license, social security card, your name appears in all capital letters, just like when you go in a cemetery. And your third grade grammar teacher taught you the difference between a proper noun and an improper noun. A proper noun, when it comes to a man or a woman, is always spelled in upper and lowercase letters. But if all the letters are capital, that indicates anything other than a man or a woman. And that is the same thing you'll find when you go to the cemetery. And the reason there's only gravestones out there and all capital letters all the time is because everybody out there is dead. So when we turn over all the rocks, the next question would be, who owns owns this place called America? What is their history? Let's go back and find out these particular people, what's in their nature back then, and that will give us a, 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 a big, panorama of what's going on and not only in the United States but in other countries. We'll be able to understand why a man will wrap a bum around himself and go into London, England and detonate that bum, killing himself and as many of the, his perceived enemies as he can. I don't want to uh, run away with your program, brother, but I'm just trying to put a little food out there for thought. Oh, no, go ahead, bro. <laughs> I'm not go I'm not mad at you. Now, do you believe that because they have taught us in most history classes as far as black people, they start with the middle passage and then they bring it over here to the United States where we were just slaves. And then it kinda of well, stops there. You know, and then there's a gap. And then they go to Harriet Tubman because they got to figure out how we got free. So then they say, okay, Harriet Tubman freed the slaves. Then we fast forward to maybe Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King, and we bypassed so many people who were uh, who built this country, and some known, some unknown. And we don't learn about that until we decide to we come across someone that's teaching us. Fortunately, I went to a HBCU of Virginia State, and our history teaches taught us those things, you know. But what happens to the individual who goes by what the school teaches and believes that that's all it is? We don't know who we are. So the well, it was a smokescreen for, you know, if I can keep you confused as to who you are, I can tell you who you're supposed to be in your belief. Do, do you concur with that? You, you, I guess. You 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 are you uh, exactly right, but once again mm-hmm. you're gonna have to look look at the magnitude of uh, or the questions you, you just asked me. First of all, <laughs> based on what I've been trying to tell you, uh, uh, it is impossible for people uh, of uh, African descent, especially, uh, to get mm-hmm. an education inside the current school system. Remember, I told you what the nine points are. Education yes, is the second one. All right, so Mm -hmm. in order for you and me to get an education, the first thing that's going to have to happen is they're going to have to teach us our ancient story, not only in Africa and going all the way back as close to the beginning of time as they can, and our ancient story 
in the West. Otherwise, we are being victimized by what is commonly referred to as miseducation. We got we got mm-hmm. the, the, the wagon, but the horse is tied to the back of the wagon. You see, <laughs> see if I if me and you we gonna say me and you we was in a uh, we was in a edu- first grade because that's where mm-hmm. the downslide started. At. Because if they're not t- teaching you, we got me and you. We got a, a so-called Indian. We got one that's called Japanese. We got one that's called Chinese. Uh, each one of us had to be uh, educated separately about our ancient story to instill pride in us mm. and put the, the, the defense mechanism in you to disseminate lies. You see what I'm saying? And uh, We conducted this experiment, just this type of experiment. I've created a library. And uh, it's an online library. Well, the first one was destroyed. Uh, they got a hold of it and destroyed it. But uh, prior to that, there was a little girl. She was going to school, and her father had uh, gotten my hold of my library. And uh, she was, um, I think that little girl, it was in the third or fourth grade. And the teacher began to teach her on Christopher Columbus. Now, what she used to do every day is she'd run home, and she'd get on the computer, and she'd get in my library, and she was accessing the truth. Now, the truth is not being taught in the school system. So she was accessing the truth, and uh, she was running off copies because they had a little printer. She was just having a ball every day. But when the teacher got on the subject by Christopher Columbus, she said, uh, uh, Christopher Columbus didn't discover no America. He was a thief. And matter of fact, uh, they put him on a boat and took him back to Spain and changed because he had to stolen people money. He was lying. And the teacher said, mm. who told you that? She said, I read it for my daddy's library. And in fact, uh, I got it in my book bag. He said, well, bring it up here. Let me take a look at it. You know, Caucasian teacher. So she took it up there, and uh, and he got a hold of it, and he would read it, and he got mad. He said, look here, you, you take this here down to the principal." And uh, you, you give it to him and, uh, 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 and tell him I sent you there. Uh-huh. So you go to the principal, another Caucasian gentleman. He wants to know why she's there. And uh, she explained the same thing to him. She said, he, my teacher tried to tell me that Christopher Lummis discovered America. How you going to discover something uh, when, when, when people are already here? So uh, he said, well, <laughs> <laughs> then she gave him the paper. He read it. He got mad. He said, look, this is what we're going to do with you. Because uh, we can't have you disrupting the class. I want you to go outside and pick up paper. And oh, so she went outside and for the rest of the evening had to pick up paper. Now we have broken, uh, 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 we have done something unlawful. So she went home and told her father. Her father called me and told me what happened. He said he was going to go up there and start kicking some you-know-what. I said, well, wait a minute. Hold on, bro. Hold, 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 hold. Let's go at this another way. I said, let's get online. Get you some of them little spy cameras. And uh, just mm-hmm. attach them. They got them in bracelets and necklaces and stuff. Put that on them. And uh, just explain to her, that, you know, not the damages, what it makes. She's pointing at them and stuff. And just show that you, she is outside picking up paper. I said, that's all you got to do. And uh, the little girl come home with it. And I said, now you, you take it and, and upload it to your computer and then download it on a DVD disc and uh, send them a copy of it. And he did. And they was calling, it was crying, it was whining. They said, look, man, we need to talk. He said, no, uh, I just need oh. to know how you're going to handle this. Who are, who, who I pick up my check from? And he said, wait, 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 wait a minute. We're going to, we, 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 look, let me, let me make a call and we'll call you back. So he, uh, they sell, sell him with him out of court and try to keep a lid on this or thing. So it's very, very important for a child, and you want to start at home, and I recommend that every man and woman in America that look like me have their own library in their own house. And so their children can get a hold of it, and their children can actually see them studying their own ancient story and knowing there's a difference between his story and your one. And if you lay the two down uh, side by side, you, re- you, you, you discover uh, that there is absolutely uh, no comparison. And right. then you have to understand why are you being attacked. You find that information out from the Independent Compensatory Code written by Neely Fuller, Jr., and Dr. Francis Cress Welsing that wrote the ISIS paper. That's right there in a the nutshell. And when you understand so, that, then uh, you understand yeah. the attack on people of color worldwide. Oh, yeah, definitely. So tell folks about your, uh, you said you had a website, so how would folks uh, get access to that website if they were interested in learning more about what you're talking about and learning more about uh, 
the books that you are referring to and things of that nature, because you did mention that you had a uh, website that folks could be uh, guided to. So for folks that are listening, they might be interested in learning more about. Okay, well, uh, my website is uh, uh, newdebtelimination.com. That's new, N-E-W, debt, D-E-B-T, elimination, E-L-I-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N.com. And uh, we got a... we got to just, they can just examine the whole site. We uh, specialize in helping people who have problems with law and stuff like that. And I also host my own uh, blog talk radio show. We was on last night with uh, Dr. Walter Williams. He's the author of The Historical Origins of Christianity and uh, The Historical Origins of Islam. And uh, we did a broadcast on uh, racism, white supremacy worldwide. And I, um, from time to time, if I'm not doing anything, I'll go around and see what people are talking about. And if there's uh, some way that I can benefit folks, then I'll get on and I'll uh, talk and see if I can assist them. And uh, that's why I'm here this evening. But the best thing to do, if you can uh, catch me on Facebook, my name is Tahaka Amana L. Bay, and I'm on Facebook. And uh, I do most of my teaching there. I put out uh, books of the week for the brothers and sisters to get a hold of them so that they can learn what's going on, get their ancient story, and get his story, too. Indeed. I can't hardly hear, brother. I said, uh, what's the name of uh, your broadcast as well, because we don't mind promoting other people as I'm well. On, um, I'm on uh, Moorish Talk Live 100. The only thing that you'll have to do, if you just type my first name into Google, everything will come up. Uh, if you just type my name into uh, YouTube, uh, there's a ton of work there that has come up, and uh, you can just click on the YouTube video. My name is spelled T-A-R-H-A-K-A, Tarhaka. Well, we definitely appreciate you calling us and giving us your insight and things of that nature because uh, we definitely know that, as you said, there are a lot of uh, – folks that are not even understanding their own stories, and you're right, it's across the uh, classes and across the races, but uh, particularly in our society, we oftentimes even let them dictate uh, what is our story, and they only pay attention to certain heroes, because I was actually just talking to one of my uh, coworkers about that earlier today, and we were talking about how a lot of times, of course, they're going to put out the uh, the big names of the folks like uh, Harriet Tubman, uh, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Christmas addicts, um, George Washington Carver, but oftentimes they leave out a lot of the other history of the people that have uh, helped actually build this country. Uh, a lot of times they even leave out the person that uh, helped create the uh, District of Columbia and others, uh, Benjamin Banneker, even though he is one of those that is sometimes mentioned, but not as mentioned probably as often as it should be. So you're right, a lot of times we don't even understand our own history. And a lot of times the other cultures, because they do teach their kids um, in the home front about their own history. So I'm glad that you're doing this and that you're making this available to a lot of people to learn about the history that exists. Um, Bob mm-hmm. Chuck Davis, who was a mentor of mine and was the founder of the African American Dance Ensemble, he was a definite proponent of us learning our own history and not just depending on uh, the books of others to uh, learn that history or into the uh, Western school system because uh, sometimes we have to step out and uh, go to sources like yours, go to other books that are out there to learn that history that is a very rich history, but too often our own folks don't know it. That's correct. And you have no idea what's missing. Yeah. You're absolutely correct about that. And too often there's just so much of the history that we don't even know. Uh, we, and sometimes if we do learn the history, we even sometimes don't even give it the kind of uh, credence that it needs to get. Because, I mean, even though we're here in, uh, at least I'm here right now, in Durham, North Carolina, we, uh, there's a lot of people that know about Pauli Murray, but they don't understand all the activism that she was involved in, even though there are... Uh, mm-hmm paintings of her and murals of her here in this area as well as uh, there's even going to be a Pauli Murray Center. I can't remember if it's already built or if it's in the works, but it's definitely, uh, if it's not already done, it will be very shortly. And uh, But if you talk to people, they may have heard the name, but they don't necessarily know what her story is. And the same with Lauren Hurston, who has actually spent some time here in Durham teaching at Central when uh, she was living. But a lot of times there are folks like that, that folks, they may know just a little bit about their history or their basic history. I mean, even like some of those authors that we know who they are in the sense of knowing they're authors of a certain era. Like we know when Langston Hughes was. We know when 
uh, Richard Wright was, but a lot of times we don't go deep enough into learning what their struggle was while they were living. Mm. Well, brother, you how would you how would you feel if you found out that um, the entire state of Florida was uh, owned, controlled, and run by us? There were no Indians. That's another label. And wow. it really is not hard to figure out. I mean, if you, if you got Japanese and uh, uh, attached to a landmass called Japan, you got Chinese attached to a landmass called China, you got yeah. uh, 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 Cubans attached to a landmass called Cuba, we even got Mexicans attached to Mexico, and it goes on and on and on. So how are we going to have Indians over here on this landmass when the name of it ain't India, and then we got a land that is called India, and the people on that landmass called Indians. Something wrong, bro. I live right here in Florida, man, 40 miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. is a 400-foot-high pyramid. We won't find nothing about that in the news. They put one right. little article about it in the newspaper one time. We found it. But then we also found out they covered up what's under the ocean. From Florida down to Bimini and from Bimini over to Cuba, we got uh, uh, underwater uh, whole civilizations with stone statues with our features on them and uh, a pyramids. But they got it. They got it. In order, in order to, in order to keep a, a a lid on the most powerful man on the planet, who's genetically dominant, we got to cut him off from knowledge of himself. They burned thousands and thousands of books uh, about our ancient story in this hemisphere and murdered the the keepers of the material. And was killing them over in Mexico. Anybody that was involved in in uh, high levels of, of knowledge and, and, and philosophy and, 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 and supreme mathematics and science, they were murdered. Right. Millions and millions of people. Uh, 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 a lot of people, you know, you, they, these are things they just don't know. Uh, the most important thing that we can do is get our ancient story in the West. See, we got most of us, a lot of us got it down to a science. Uh, we can talk to you all day long about it. Uh, 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 Egypt mm-hmm. and Africa, but uh, we need to start digging over here. We got yep. thousands yep. and thousands of caves in the Grand Canyon. They used to fuel the. They had a they had a problem with the uh, uh, coal, trying to fuel the uh, trains and during the age of the locomotive over here, and they had them went in the caves up there in the Grand Canyon and took all the mummies out, Egyptian mummies, and was using them for fuel. The, the few of the trains across the railroad track. You don't know that. Yeah, you're right. There's and a lot of history. Label somebody something else. Hmm? Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of history that folks don't know. But I was just wondering what you think. It seems that there's a lot of uh, the good things I have noticed that there's a change in society. And I'm not saying that they're, everybody's getting it right, but there does seem to be more of a movement toward people um, even doing research on some of the ancient religions. Because I'm noticing more and more, at least here in. Uh, the Durham area and the North Carolina area, and I think I've seen, even seen it in other parts of the country, more and more people are starting to study the ways of the, um, what you just laid with is the uh, ancient Indians or the Native Americans, whatever you want to call them, uh, but, um, and they're studying the ways of, like, the people from the Europa nations and things of that nature. So you're finding more people that are actually getting involved in these kind of, they call them Eastern religions, but a lot of these were religions that were not allowed to be practiced initially because, when uh, we came into the West, whether it's from Africa or whether it was from other parts of the uh, great world that we're in, they were trying to eliminate us understanding our own ancient uh, religious beliefs and systems and, of, and things of that nature, and we're trying to push us more and more toward a Western kind of belief. But I am seeing more and more people that are starting to uh, recognize some of the faults of that and are at least starting to research and do some it's surface research in some cases, but some are getting deeper. But it seems like there's more and more people that are trying to get a greater understanding of um, thoughts that are, like, based in Africa, based in some of the uh, Asian countries, even based in um, Native American belief systems and things of that nature. So it's one that is, uh, you've mentioned that some of the things that you had and some of the guests being Muslims and things of that nature. I don't know what your own religion is, but I was wondering what you thought of this new trend, at least it seems to be that we're getting more and more folks that are recognizing that some of what well, exists uh, in, in the well, existence what, what, 
what what is happening is uh people are people are waking up and uh uh, uh we we've done a tremendous amount of shows on uh religion itself and keep in mind religion is one of the nine points of racism white supremacy worldwide uh the, the, the most dangerous thing that a man can engage in is belief but people don't know that what he wants to get involved in is uh understanding Dealing with what he knows for a fact, and he can prove and put on the table. But the trend you are referring to is people are getting away from religion, and they are engaging in spiritualism. And that is right. what uh, the uh, 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 ancient Africans had, and the, uh, especially ancient Egyptians. They, they, a lot of people say, well, the, uh, they are uh, polytheistic, and they believe in many gods. Well, the question is, uh, according to who? Well, history right. proves is a who story. So here's a man. What you, which one? What you finna say? Well, uh, 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 well, well. So the thing is, when we start doing our own investigation, that's when things start changing. That's when people start waking up. You got nine points, and whatever them nine points is, they are designed to keep you in check. You got to you, you 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 the most powerful thing that you can have is knowledge of yourself. There was one major saying throughout the ancient land of Egypt in the east and the west, and that was man know thyself. Well, what does that mean? That automatically takes you back to your uh, 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 to the beginning of you. Uh, uh, we were the, the, the Egyptians are the ones who brought the light of civilization to the world. There there's books called. Um, uh, Introduction to African Civilization by John G. Jackson. Another written uh, called Of Water and the Spirit by Maladoma Patrice Somme. You can see that type of spiritualism in full force that I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I know, I, I hope I'm not stepping on uh, folks' toes out there, but we're going to have to shift and we're going right. to have to start uh, taking control of our thinking. We've got to understand. Our power. If if you if you want something, uh, you 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 got you got high concentrations of carbon inside your body, uh, and, and, and and what is being called is melanin. There's no such thing. It can't be defined. We gotta we gotta start asking questions to major issues. We gotta come to a conclusion about the definition of who and what is God. We got to come to a conclusion about the definition of who and what is Jesus. What does the ancient historical record say? How far we can go back and jump off the pages of the Bible? And what do your story say about these subjects? We're going to have to answer these questions and get it in our brain. And when we get it, then you are powerful. Because uh, it's, it's very difficult to oppress someone. Who ain't sleep? Yeah, and that's what it is. It's about trying to wake people up because definitely there's a lot of folks that are uh, not awake about the different things that are going on. I was just wondering, both on your show and just in your own opinion, because this has come up even in past shows, what you think about folks that are uh, trying to find um, ways to unify the different folks that are being um, oppressed in one form or another. I mean, we just had the callers that had uh, taken down the statue, um, the Confederate statue earlier, they called in earlier, and I know that a lot of times when the actions like these are taken, one of the things that people are quite proud of is the fact that it um, crosses across divisions, and it finds it's a way to, in their mind to unify people that are all being oppressed at the same time. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that and whether we should try to, we had a caller last week that said that we need to get ourselves together and that we didn't need to try to do unification with people that are also being oppressed that are, say, of Latin background or of quote-unquote. Well, the, 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 first, the first thing, uh, uh, and the way I see that, uh, brother, and it's based on uh, what I know about racism and white supremacy. See, when you got a man uh, standing there waving a flag, he on the uh, uh, soapbox, and he's hollering about uh, white supremacy in any kind of shape, form, or fashion, uh, you don't have to worry about him. You can see him. You know what he stands for. But when you got another man that looks like him across the street, 
with a shooting child in a briefcase and walking by looking over at him and he keep on walking, that's the one you got to watch. See, this this particular thing here is deep. It's ingrained. See, the, the right. white supremacist, he's no, no longer out in the streets and uh, he, he's still doing it. Uh, some of them are uh, with the white sheets and, and all of that, but uh, he's now uh, taking a seat in his program. He's in the economics, education, entertainment, labor law, politics, religion, sex, and war. He's in the school system. He's in the jailhouse. When it comes to the police, uh, in order to understand, all you have to do is go back and do the re- research on the beginning of the police. There was a time when we had police, okay? When they came on the scene, what, what, what was the deal? What were they doing? What happened? I mean, they, were they, I mean, were they, they the protecting the police. servant or were they slave catchers? Which one? I mean, the initial, uh, the, the, the initial police, yeah, the initial police officer was the slave patrol. He was, uh, he was basically the one trying to keep the slaves under under uh, check. All right. So, what is he doing today? He's <laughs> coming out of the game. Not all those. Hold up, please. Hold up. And, and then he got the same thing that he had back then. Cause, cause he back then, uh, uh it, it wasn't just all uh, Caucasians. Uh, they had uh, had a brother back there too with him. Some of the brothers were back there too with him. You know, right. same thing today. So uh, we got to see when you get the uh, 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 ancient story on something, then it becomes clear to you and you look at the nature of the situation. So as far as the police are concerned, have his nature changed? If, if he's doing the same thing he did back then, today, that means it has not changed. So that means that whoever it is that's paying him and controlling him, uh, he's carrying out their ideology. So I had to bring you over another book to read. Go go read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. What was the title of that book and one more time? And then that'll shed a little bit more light. What was the title of that book one more time? The Creature from Jekyll Island. All right. That's when they uh, created the Federal Reserve. Uh, most people... Uh, 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 don't know that the Internal Revenue Service is a private, private company. Now, their job is to balance the books. So if you look up the definition of the word law, how, uh, uh, how do we have law? Law involves justice. Justice guarantees that nobody is mistreated. Justice also guarantees that the person who needs the most help Get the most help. But you see, yeah, yeah. Uh, coat houses th- all throughout the United States uh, with, the, with, with the word justice wrote on it. Something wrong, soldier? Yeah. Well, here, right. here's a question. When, when that word justice was defined, at that time, they said all men, right, are created mm-hmm. equal. Who said but it? We were. But we were three fifths of a person by definition. Who said it? So we. But did you actually, they, uh, what I'm, what I'm saying yeah. is, they they never we were never counted in that equation. So when you said all men, and when they went to count our ancestors and elders, one one whole man was only three fifths of a person. That's crazy. Now, said, now who that said that? Up. Who said the founding the, all, all, the founding all, all fathers? All the dudes that signed the Declaration of Independence said that. <laughs> all right, now we had uh, people that looked like me and you in this country during the time they were signing it. Uh, 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 was slavery going on? And if it was, was any of them only slaves? They well, actually, have. you bring, you bring, yeah, but you bring up a good question because actually that came up even with the Colin uh, Kaepernick situation because. One of my friends, uh, Carl Kenny, who was actually on this show before, he's a minister, and he's um, on one of his Facebook posts, he mentioned it. If you look up the Star Spangled Banner and the lyrics of the Star Spangled Banner, yeah. there's actually a reference to slaves in the Star Spangled Banner. Yes. Yeah. Well, see, is, is you, 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 we back to square one. Uh, racism, white supremacy, is global. And it got nine points that affect everybody alive on the planet. And uh, and and what we got to really understand is, uh, based on the magnitude of this ideology, this thing is a religion, 
And it just so happens to be the most powerful religion on earth. So when you look at the record, uh, they go all the way back, go past Hiroshima, go all the way back to Rome, go beyond Rome, go and you discover that uh, everywhere uh, this particular uh, man ever went on this earth, he killed somebody. He don't get along with nobody on earth. And he can't because it is not in his nature to do so. He's a psychopath. He's a sociopath. Now, I'm talking about the racist white supremacist, the one you can see and the one you can't see. Right. Because a lot of times those people in the corporate world are some of the worst ones because, like you said, they will give you lip service on one term and then totally uh, act another way in their actions of what they're doing. So they may give you lip service that they're being wonderful to you and doing things that are for your good, but their actions are not sharing that same thought. Their actions are actually doing something that are harmful to the people. Well, the reason why he's doing it is what we got to define. He's doing it for two major reasons. Number one, uh, you and I represent the genetic annihilation of his species just through regular procreation without firing a shot. You, he's a, he's in his nature to be. Uh, see, this thing is against all people that are non-white. You, you you understand it? See, when you get this thing down to a science, you'll really be able to look at this lion dead in the face and know that he's a lion. We got a lot of us uh, trying to look at the lion, trying to do something with the lion, and, and calling him a rabbit. And we do that until he bites us. Then we realize, wait a minute, this is something different here, man. This is a different kind of thing here. This 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 man, uh, he, he wipe out whole civilizations and then invent new ones and, and put a label on them and get them credit for something belonging to you. You know, all kind of stuff. He went in uh, uh, Australia and murdered the people of the land, and the people wasn't dying fast enough, so he went up into the mountains and poisoned the water, and the people started dying. He destroyed 95% of the original Hawaiians. Well, Just by his presence, because he walked in there with albinism, tuberculosis, smallpox, all this right here on him. Well, Same thing to the people he labeled as Indians. Well, Whole cultures the, 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 that's gone, missing from this earth. Whole the race is a, the, well, like I can't use that word, because he's the only one that belongs to a race. There ain't but one race, and that's him. Right, everybody else is, is you can't you can't be a, you can't have a race you can't be the part of a race. He 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 invented the word. Yes. Man, I, I don't want to take over your show. I mean, you asked me a question. I'm just and I mean, it, 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 I might be stepping on some folks' toes out there, but I'm sorry. I you know I'm involved in what's called justice. Well, we and justice it. is what you use to replace racism, white supremacy, with. Right. Because right. so he can't be just. It's not in his nature to be just. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely right. Hey, Dean. What's up, bro? I think I heard it. I think I heard the bell ring again. Yeah. Let's let's find out who else is at the door. All right. Let's see. Thanks for calling the voice of the people. Who are we talking to today? Hello. This is Ideal Ortiz. Hey, hey Ideal. Hello. How are you all doing tonight? We're doing well, good. We're having a, we started off with having a discussion about what was going on with the uh, activists that pulled down the um, statue earlier. We had the loan and uh, Eva call in earlier, and then we've got this gentleman from Florida that's talking to us right now. But uh, <clears throat> I know for a fact that you are also one that has been involved in activism as well, uh, taking it from a different approach. But you know, part of the conversation is just kind of what's happening with our youth and how we're getting youth activism going on and you know when I think of activists in the communities that are you know in the uh, 
under 40, under 45 club, I'll, I usually think of you. And you, <laughs> you know, you, you bring another perspective to it because you uh, bring not just the uh, African-American perspective, um, having been married to a brother and everything, but you also bring the Hispanic perspective. So I was just curious if you were talking about what you think is going on in terms of our activism in the world and what you think is uh, generating a lot of this kind of activism that we're seeing, yeah. particularly among our younger folks. Yeah, I definitely believe that activism in the past and in the current moment and in the future is absolutely going to require a multi-generational approach. Um, you know, there and often I find that um, movement work, uh, the elders in movement work are sometimes not that thrilled <laughs> about a multi-generational approach because our 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 mainstream culture, our pop culture, often um, celebrates youth um, in a kind of selfish, um, self-centered kind of way and elevates a particular way of being youthful in a way that um, elders don't necessarily appreciate because they think it means replacing them and getting them to move out of the way. When I know that truthfully, having worked with young people for over a decade directly on the front lines of public health campaigns to move policies and environmental and systems changes to improve the health of entire communities, that young people very much want to be in partnership, that what's going on in terms of how youth are portrayed in the media is wanting to take over and not listen and not be in partnership, to not be under tutelage of folks who have been um, down the road ahead of them, that – that that's all really a lie, that that is propaganda that helps keep um, generations from working uh, more closely together. And so what I've seen on the front lines of community work with young people is that they very much want to be in partnership. They want to learn from um, older folks who have um, done more work and had more experience. They are hungry kinds of relationships. They They are hungry to be seen as who they really are, um, by the, the adults and elders in their community. And so I truly believe that successful activism is going to have to require this, if not just for the fact that young people are going to inherit um, as adults the fruits of the labor um, of our current day movement, but also because it creates an expectation for those young people about what they need to do as they get um, older in years to pull up the ranks behind them, to constantly have a sense of, Um, passing down and continuity in the movement so that we can have really good forward motion in the work that we do in communities. And so that's part of the day-to-day experience I was blessed to have for for many, many years when I worked um, with young people. And that hasn't been too long that I've transitioned from direct work with young people, but I continue to be a deep supporter of that work just from a different position at this point. And for folks that um, don't know about uh, you, Idell, um, well, let folks know how you got involved in activism yourself. Because, like I said, I've always known you to be somewhat of an activist. You're in a different role now because how you work in this yeah. organization. Um, no problem. Uh, well, you know, as it is, as is, as is the case for most young people, I had um, a broader awakening to activism work when I was in college and um, wanted to do something about the fact that so few Latinos. Um, were attending the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I matriculated to the university in 1998 and uh, noticed that there were not um, specialized recruitment programs to help um, Latino and Latina students um, to come to the university. Um, There are some traditions about how (laughs) folks from the Latinx communities raise their children, and going away to college is not necessarily – Um, Going away, away from the home is not necessarily a part of the more traditional sort of um, culture um, of our families. And so we we had to think of ways of strategies to really um, rope in the parents and to get them to see the Carolina campus as a part of their family. We had to do that. We had to ameliorate the family as a whole and not just court the student. So while I was there, helped to create a program that, would successfully recruit Latinx students and um, eventually was hired by Student Affairs and the um, Office of uh, Multicultural Affairs to um, implement this program. And to this day, that position still exists. Um, 
uh, after it was created in about 2000, so it's still existing. And I want to say that their enrollment has increased by over three or 400 percent since then. And so that was the beginning of my journey of thinking about cross sectors, cross departments, and um, leveraging the resources of an institution and working with the students on campus. Um, and the cultural organizations to help implement a program like that with the support of lots of different people and the blessing of the administration uh, that lives on to this day. Afterwards, transition to doing uh, voting rights work for formerly incarcerated individuals um, at the ACLU um, during uh, the Help America Vote Act uh, season after the Bush election, uh, where he was elected by a court of law. And so got to learn a little bit more about how the voting system works and how um, information needed to be put out there, and in effect, learned even deeper how systems disenfranchise its citizens uh, and work to bring awareness um, across different organizations to getting sure, make, getting to make sure that folks did not lose their right to vote. And then transitioned from that work into um, doing public health work, which was quite unexpected for me, um, and learned about the social justice aspect of public health work. In fact, public health is underneath the umbrella of social justice, if I might be so bold, and worked there on a wonderful campaign, primarily at the beginning on teen tobacco prevention, uh, highlighting the exploitation of the tobacco industry to target young people, especially young people of color in low-income communities, to use products that could eventually end in their death. And so worked by hiring high school students from the Durham area at first, and then moved over into hiring students from Raleigh, North Carolina as well. Um, but we had multiple offices across the state and grew our work from not just working in partnership with young people to build these campaigns across the state with the support of young people at the forefront um, on teen tobacco prevention, but also underage drinking prevention, substance abuse prevention, um, access to health care, oral health care, and obesity prevention. So, you know, all the easy things. <laughs> but young people were up to the challenge, and that was quite beautiful, and, you know, whenever we lost our bravery, um, they were often there to inspire us, and so we needed each other in that work because it is very daunting to go up against very complicated systems with huge, huge moneyed lobbies um, that are always lobbying and have many resources at every turn to um, convince our government to not do what is in the best interest of the people. Yeah, definitely. Um, you raised up a couple of different interesting things doing this. I can't hear you right now. Can you repeat your question? I said, I said that you've raised a couple of interesting things just based on learning the history and everything that some of our listeners may be interested in, know it about, and I'm going to throw them out there, not necessarily in any sense of a order of what I'm thinking about. But one of the things sure. that you talked about, UNC, one of the things that you talked about, UNC, like I said, we had uh, Lone on earlier who did the thing with the uh, Confederate uh, statue, and I was wondering mm -hmm. what your own personal thoughts were with uh, the. Uh, Sam, because Sam is one of those statues that yes. you're talking about taken down in UNC. So I want to know what some yes. of your own personal thoughts were about what's going on and what should go on and whether that needs to come yes. down and some of your own um, personal thoughts are, about it. Well, well, my personal thoughts are is that it should never have been erected in the first place and it should have been brought, up, brought down a long time ago. Um, one of the positions I held through my history that I omitted to mention is at one point I did serve as the assistant director of the campus Y. And the Campus Y is no longer affiliated with the YM or YWCA. It's actually a freestanding organization that is part of the campus that works on social justice issues, and it's an incubator for social justice projects. Inevitably, many students that come through those walls um, have worked on campaigns to end the promotion, the false promotion of white supremacists on UNC's campus as heroes to the university. And so whether it is the renaming of various halls or – the renaming of particular institutions within the campus, um, or even to remove the statue. Um, they fought many times to either bring more events or speakers or um, monuments to the real heroes of our history, um, as well as also um, rectifying the inaccurate telling of history on campus with these folks, whether they were KKK wizards or others, um, to remove um, those names and sort of uh, monuments to these folks when we know that that story is not being told accurately. Um, one of the things I've always thought was very ironic, there's a wonderful poet by the name of C.J. Sweet that brings this up, um, where he talks about um, Chapel Hill as a town that um, we know sort of 
um, sort of in like discussions on the street, pedestrian conversations as a very uh, liberal community. But for those who are from Chapel Hill or live in Chapel Hill as something other than students, they're all too aware of the fact that racism runs just as deeply in Chapel Hill as in any other part of the state of North Carolina. And so um, there is a poem that he does about uh, his town, and I don't remember the name of it, so I hope he'll forg- CJ will forgive me. But one of the things he mentions in that poem is how there's a monument supposedly to the unsung heroes of Chapel Hill, uh, very close to the statue of Silent Sam. And he mentions in this poem, that, well, the statue that's built in um, memoriam to the unsung heroes, to the slaves that built the university, is a table with four little stools around it. And there are many, many bodies that are carved into the statue that lift this table up. Um, And, you know, at first blush, this might seem like a great gesture, but in his poem, he talks about how one day he happened upon this memorial to the unsung heroes and saw a white family eating lunch on top of this table. And perhaps maybe that uh, was not thought out so well by the student who um, put together the monies for that particular uh, uh, marker on campus. And so I just, um, I beg for more analysis on the part of university officials um, to think uh, about, no, to really just go ahead and decide to bring bring this statue down. So those are those are my personal opinions. I never liked the fact that the statue was there. Um, none of the students I know really did. Um, and it's not lost on me that all the statues are near courthouses and facing north, as if to say that we're, re- we're still ready for battle. And so that signifier every day as a person of color didn't exactly comfort me um, knowing that slaves with the university were uncompensated, have unmarked graves, and, you know, where curriculum still often leaves so much out about folks who really uh, built this country. And that's one of the things I was going to ask you, Shane, like I said, this conversation may go a little bit around to, to a variety of topics, but just still dealing with activism. Um, when you were a student, I'm sure that um, there was some conversation about some of those people who were being protected by the DREAM Act and things of that nature, because a lot of times those are folks that are involved in um, young families. So there are a lot of times there might be people that are of college age or of high school age, and we know that right now Trump is threatening to pretty much end that program, which means that a lot of folks that are of um, Latin or Latino descent are going to be facing kind of uh, whatever those consequences might be. So I was wondering what you're hearing in the street about what's going on in terms of this possible repeal of the DREAM Act and things of that nature. Yeah, my heart really goes out for students who are facing this time at a time when North Carolina could really use all of the emerging talent and dedicated citizens that it can, um, you know, in our aging, you know, population and in uh, a variety of industry sectors that need, you know, fresh new talent that are ready to be part of the fabric of North Carolina Um, It really hurts my heart to see the administration considering doing something that could distract these students from pursuing their dreams to not just better their own lives, but to contribute to the state and to the country. And so it just just seems so short-sighted, given that this is a time when students should be able to continue investing in their own personal and professional development. Um, And, you know, you know, borders are an interesting thing, you know, borders and, uh, uh, you know, Citizenship, uh, those are such complicated concepts for me as a child of immigrant parents, knowing that so often um, immigrants know the laws and have a sense of country that is um, different from people who have taken it for granted. I'm not going to say it's better. I'll I'll say that it's keener (laughs) because I assure you that if anyone had to retake a citizenship test, well, not retake, but if any, you know, natural-born citizens had to take a test that my parents took, they probably wouldn't pass. And, um, you know, we'll, we, would, we would have some interesting dynamics if people actually had to do the things that other immigrants have to do in order to be members of this country. So you're saying that if people had to take that actual citizenship test that are natural-born I think born a lot of people's to... citizenship would be revoked if they uh, were asked to do the same things that other people had to do um, to be part of this country, whether it was the lawyer's fees, whether it was the visits to your consulate, whether it was the tests you had to take, the medical exams you have to participate in. I mean, there are so many hoops, and I think that people are very um, unaware of exactly what the process is 
in order to come to this country through the ways that have been listed. Um, and so I, I just think people are very in the dark about what it means to become a citizen or to come here, quote, unquote, legally. Um, and all of that, all of that is hidden, I think, from the average American citizen to make them think, oh, you know, it's, it's really easy. Why don't you just do it the, oh, the legal way is the way they throw it out there. But sometimes the legal way is we're talking about two decades and thousands of dollars that people may not have. Um, or time that they may not have because they're escaping civil war, they're escaping gangs, um, they're escaping all kinds of conditions that are, quite frankly, often created by the U.S. Um, as, a, as a country next door sometimes, whether it's our country's demand for drugs or our country's demand for low-cost food and our um, way of bankrupting industries in other people's countries with um, trade agreements that don't benefit the countries that these uh, folks are immigrating from. So I think there's a lot of dynamics, and we, and we kind of vacuum seal ourselves off, and we, um, you know, we don't offer a lot of mercy or compassion for the consequences of our own consumerism in this country. Yeah, we definitely don't do that, and unfortunately that's something that we oftentimes don't pay attention to and things of that nature. Now, one of the things that we were talking to Lone about earlier, and I've noticed it more and more, is that um, with this particular round of activism, and I'm not saying it hasn't happened before, I mean, it probably happened even with MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., and things of that nature, but it seems to me that there's a lot more unity of purpose, meaning that I'm seeing a lot more people that are fighting against these kind of causes, be it um, the Confederate statues, be it the immigration things that are going on, be it whatever some of the other concerns that people have in the uh, movement and everything, but it seems that there's more across the vision kind of uh, unity that we might not have seen in the past, like between the African American community and the Latin community, between those in the LGBT and certain members of the religious community, mm -hmm. between, as you just mentioned, even some of the young and old dynamics. And I was wondering, mm -hmm. in your own work and in your own observations, are you seeing something similar, or do you think that they're still creating those divisions that are able to divide us? Um, no, I am seeing a little, a lot more um, unity, but I think that some of it has to do with the fact that there's been so much more overt uh, negative rhetoric asking to take away things that allow for quality of life for so many people. And I think that while those things were hidden or a little more veiled um, in terms of the way our leaders would talk about those things, um, and, I, and when I say our leaders, I mean like elected officials and other folks who have um, power in key institutions, that when they were being more veiled, I think it was easier for people to sort of not be as awake about those things in the general public or in more emerging activists. And I think that with more, um, more heated language and also just quite downright terrorist and offensive language, um, people are coming together because there's no such thing as pretending that that could be taken in any other way that language about immigrants or about the LGBTQ community or about people who are Muslim, you know, whatever the, whoever the group that's being targeted by, you know, the folks in power, it's no longer covert. Um, and I think that that does make it salient for people that, oh, you, you got to know what side you're on when those comments come up. Um, but what I will say is that what, what, what I still feel like there's a lot of work to do on is helping people understand not just the dynamics of how those words make you feel and that we don't want people to be threatened with words, right? Um, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done about the way the structures work, the way the government works and how it's not working for some folks, um, how, you know, just all these levers of power and how they do and don't work. I think that the more technical information is sometimes still missing and, um, and so that, that, that helps to up, make, allow those things to continue. And so while we might, while, and don't get me wrong, this is not meant to be shade at anything, while we might take down the gestures, like the statues of white supremacy, we still have to dismantle other pieces of the structure in terms of how our systems work in society. And so that is a part. But if you, if you do one without the other, you know, we're, we're still going to be here. And that's one of the things I was going to ask is one of the things that I've noticed in the past, and I mean, I think people that are even part of my circle are still guilty of this, is that while we talk oftentimes about how people are still intimidated, that even though we're in 2017, we still have people that are intimidated by an African-American brother if they're in the elevator with them and everything, that they still have those stereotypes. 
I also think that we have stereotypes revolving around the Latin community because you still have people that if they hear somebody of your background or one of the other Latin countries speaking in Spanish, then automatically they have this stereotype that they're this fear that they might be talking about them, even though there's a good possibility mm-hmm. that they're just discussing the they're just discussing the latest recipe that they got in mind and they got nothing to do with you okay. on the elevator whatsoever. Okay. Right. Well, you know, Deepak Chopra a long time ago I heard him on a panel saying, you know, what people think of me is really none of my business, right? Um, but then there's, I want to say that it, I forgot who said this, um, that added another little piece to it, but if you can do something about what you think of me, then it's my problem. And I think that was James Baldwin. And so for me, I'm not so uh, busy, worried about, um, you know, do you like me? Do you have a good opinion of me? I'm only concerned about whether or not you can turn me down for a loan or um, whether I won't get into a school of my choice or if I can't get hired because you have these race-based beliefs about me. And so that's when I get concerned about it around the structural pieces. But for me, the fight for humanity, for liberation, for justice has never been about whether or not people like me. And I think we need to be real clear about that. I don't care if you think I'm talking about you on the elevator when I speak Spanish to my family. Um, I only care if you want to arrest me because I'm speaking something other than English. Things like that. Yeah, so you're more concerned about the more important issues as to, like, whether it's going to be something that might impact you on a direct level, not what somebody's theory of you is if you're speaking Spanish yeah, to your family I mean, or – I mean, humanity's going to have all kind of pettiness towards each other <laughs> and lots of joy and happiness, you know. We're all going to have opinions of each other. Oh, I don't like her shoes or, oh, I don't like her hair or, you know, I think her voice is great, you know, whatever. Um, but really where it matters is, is the structural pieces. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that because oftentimes uh, people just get caught up in all kinds of negative things that really don't have anything to do with anything whatsoever because of, whatever their own stereotypes are and everything. And while it might be, I've heard it said that a person of color cannot be a racist based on the fact that they are a person of color. That, that I think is probably true. But at the same time, we all do have our own little stereotypes and things of that nature. So I'm sure that there are people that associate um, stereotypes that they have that exist when they see, say, the uh the Hispanic lady with the brother or the white, or the white lady with the brother, that they all they are going to make certain assumptions about what's going on, even though that might not have anything to do with the reality of what's really happening. But people just get kind of like stuck up in these little crazy uh, stereotypes and stereo games and things of that of that nature. But um, I had a point and I was ready to make it, but I will get to that later. Dean, you still with me? I'm still here, brother. So what are you thinking about the discussion? As you can tell, Ideal has been involved in a lot of different things in society, and uh, it's definitely still involved in a lot of things that are going on in the community and things of that nature. And she's actually actually moved more, which we did not get into, into the uh, philanthropic side of, like, giving money to people that are trying to fight against different social justice and things of that nature. Because you've been involved with, uh, what's the trust you're involved with again? Who, me? Ideal. Oh, okay. Say again. I said, okay. what's the organization you're involved with now? You, oh, you oh, I'm the sorry. Way. I'm sorry. So, yeah, so I still work in public health campaigns, um, and so um, we're, I currently work at the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust. Right. So she's now working in the trust area of the public health campaign and is actually working as with one of the major foundations. And that foundation, that their focus is health issues, but they are actually, what kind of organizations do they give money to that people that might be interested? So sometimes um, we partner with clinics, um, hospitals, community-based organizations that are doing community-wide efforts for health. Um, Really, you know, we see that lots of people have an opportunity to be partners in health improvement. And so this isn't just um, directly health-related organizations that can be um, part of you know, the family, I should say. Uh, um, But I think that uh, we have a wide vision about who all can do this work. And so um, we focus mainly in rural communities. 
as we try to improve the health in communities that have often suffered quite a bit economically. Um, and so we, we seek to try to bring relief to those communities and thinking creatively with community members about how to bring about health improvement. So that's some great work that has to be done in this community big time because that's another area that unfortunately because of things that go on in our current administration has been targeted big time because a lot of the uh, things that are happening in health care and particularly in rural areas seem to be targeted more and more as there seems to be more threats toward even some of those things being either cut down or reduced. Mm-hmm. And that's been a tough thing to watch. So um, we mentioned it earlier, and I was just wondering, um, and you kind of alluded to it, but and we talked about some of the unity that's going on, but when you talk to youth activists and things of that nature, what advice do you give them in order to have them involved with the old guard and vice versa? What advice do you give to the old guard in order for them to hear oh, some yeah. of the voices? Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost with like the young folks show up, you know, show up and um, you know, when you find opportunities, definitely, you know, show up and ask good questions that there isn't, I know it sounds like really old school trite advice, but there really is no such thing as a dumb question. And so there's no way to elevate your skills to get connected to history, to, to fill in the gaps that you may need support on unless you let us know what it is that um, you don't know and where you'd like to grow or what you're interested in. So definitely just show up and share, hey, I want support in this. And don't just settle for um, busy work. And don't settle for adults that tell you that you are the leaders of tomorrow. That phrase always irks me because you're not le- living in a world that's just fake astroturf today until you become 18. You are living in the real world right now, and this is a very real moment. Um, Despite how young you might be, it is very real now, and so there is no reason uh, for any adult to tell you that uh, your participation should be less uh, uh, of lesser sort of um, importance or sidelined with busy work um, when really, you know, with the proper training and support, you can definitely uh, be a, a partner, a robust partner at the work. Um, so that's what I would say is just look for opportunities. Ask, you know, be bold and ask for adults um, to make room for you at the table, even in places that might not have um, proactive spaces for you as a young person to be in. Just go ahead and jump right in. That position that I um, lobbied for at the university didn't exist before, and it started with me asking a question of Dr. Irvin, who was the director at the time, the special assistant to the chancellor um, for the Office of Multicultural Affairs, and I asked him, I said, why aren't these programs in place? And we just had lots of long, deep conversations about this, um, and eventually he gave me a shot. I worked for free for a whole year before he created the position um, officially on the payroll, but it's one of the things that I was willing to sacrifice um, in route to uh, in route to trying to create a lasting resource at the university. And Latino students on the campus have since, you know, done so much to expand their presence on campus and to build um, spaces where the issues of the Latinx community can be more broadly discussed. Um, and so, so you know, I showed up. I asked questions. I stayed at the helm. Um, I didn't back away. Um, I was willing to um, make mistakes um, and grow from them and be and be taught. I was willing to be taught. Um, so that's what I would say for the young folks. As far as the elders, what I would say is um, don't let the trauma of your past uh, life inhibit the, uh, you from giving young people a chance. Sometimes we want to protect young people so much from the hardships that we face as we did advocacy work, whether it was dealing with uh, very traumatizing frontline work around racism in the civil rights movement. And I think that sometimes those experiences have hurt us so deeply and we haven't healed enough from them. And then the idea of young people getting back into the saddle um, on some of these efforts with us and um, getting out there and suffering some of the same things that we may have done, whether it's, you know, going to the legislature or facing off at a rally, I think that sometimes uh, we protect young people too much uh, to the point where we don't allow them to have uh, access to the real work because we don't want them to be disappointed or turned off or hurt 
Um, and while I do think that there is an element of being aware of what is appropriate in certain certain circumstances and providing for enough safety, I think that uh, hiding the difficulty of the work and not leaning into the talents and um, the support that young people can provide our movement work is a huge mistake. We don't have the luxury of leaving the capacity of our young people on the table. We do not have that luxury in this um, moment. Um, I don't think we've ever had that luxury. Um, and so young people make up a quarter, a quarter of our communities. And if, uh, you know, if a company said that they did a survey of everybody in a neighborhood and left out a quarter of the residents, we would say that that wasn't enough, you know, that that wasn't okay for them to just say, oh, we're not going to ignore a whole quarter of the community. And so I think adults need to kind of think about their perspective that a quarter of the community, that's young people are part of your community, and that if you're going to do community work, you have to include members from every sector of your community. And youth or young people are definitely a formidable sector and need to be a part of the work, need to be held close, need to be taught, um, but we need to do that in a way that um, is developmentally appropriate, that understands that they're new to this work, um, leans in and gives them enough responsibility to where they know that if they got missing from the work that it would be a problem. Um, and that helps to demonstrate trust, and it helps to demonstrate that you're willing to share power when you give them that much uh, uh, responsibility. Um, but, you know, adults sometimes don't want to do that because we get scared that, oh, well, it, what if they don't show up? and then we're left holding the bag. And sometimes that's going to happen, but it's a bigger problem if we never trust our young people and they never um, get asked to perform that much responsibility um, in our movement work uh, because they, don't, they can't just turn on the light bulb at 18 if they've never been tested and supported in their growth um, to handle that kind of responsibility and to be part of movement work with that much uh, responsibility. So it's, it's important for them to practice those skills before they get to 18 because we can't expect miracles just because they cross into adulthood on paper um, without the kind of uh, experiences that working together hand-in-hand hand can bring them. And I think that's essential. Oh, yeah, definitely. And what do you think about those people that try to, uh, as people get not quite in the 18 to 25 range, but maybe even in the 30 and 40 range, and they're ready to take the mantle of leadership in certain organizations, but then they get kind of thrown their whole attitude of, but you haven't done enough groundwork yet to step into that role. I'm thinking about like some of the criticisms that we're hearing oh. with certain mayoral candidates and certain other things, and it's not just in Durham. We've heard it from yeah. other candidates in other cities and other I mean, places. I just think people who have that criticism are not students of history. <laughs> I mean, you know, if if you're a Christian, you definitely can't talk about leaders being too young because Jesus was 33. So let's be clear. Um, so um, I think that you know, once you're in your late 20s and early 30s, if if you if you you know done some groundwork, I I think that it all depends and it's all about context, right? So if young people um, or let's say younger adults, right, in their tw- late 20s and 30s. Um, have elders in their life that they lean into, right? They're connected to the through line, right? They pay attention to the lessons of the elders before them, maybe their ancestors that have passed on and keep those close. If that, if they show humility to that heritage and stay connected to elders that are still living, if they show respect to children and constantly want to stay in connection and community with those folks and have the respect of the youth community as well, that is a really beautiful thing to see. Um, but I, I, I really lament this attitude that your 30s are not enough because we know that there are so many key leaders and movements. I mean, think about the age of Martin Luther King. Think about the age of um, Malcolm. Think about Jesus. Think about all – I mean, and these, this is high company, don't get me wrong. Um, but I just think that it's unfair um, in this moment to pretend – as if we haven't been led to really great places, to really beautiful prophetic vision with people who were young. That's just, I mean, that just flies in the face of what we know about history. Yeah, exactly. And I don't understand why people have that kind of attitude, but oftentimes they do, and it seems like they just want to not even look at the activists, whoever the activists are, if they're in their 30s and or 40s, and look at their greater yeah. picture, what they've all been involved I mean, in. I was, of- I was I was part of a nonprofit organization that helped was was being founded 
by a gang of, you know, two or three 20-some-year-olds, 20-some-year-olds, um, a handful, I think one person was in their 30s, and everyone else was in their early 40s, and we formed the statewide organization that eventually did work nationally. And so, you know, and we had been nationally recognized. I mean, by the time, but before I even got to the age of 30, I had been, my youth team and I, you know, all young people in high school and myself had already been recognized three times in a row by nationally founded organizations um, for the work that we did right here in Durham, North Carolina. So, you know, this idea that, like, young folks don't pump out stellar work that, that does great, great things um, for their communities is just false. I mean, I've been, I've been around it too often to buy into that. Yeah, you've definitely seen folks that are doing great things and it's covering all kinds of age ranges, everybody from folks mm-hmm. like uh, Carl Kenny and Alma Sadi who are definitely in the um, older, above 40 crowd to those that are like definitely still younger that are doing activism uh, not even sure what Holmes' age is, but I think she's somewhere in either her 20s or 30s, those folks that were involved in the uh, taking down of the statue and things of that nature. So definitely in general we've seen a wide range of people of all ages that definitely uh, seem to get the whole concept of the fact that it has to be a multi-level movement in the sense of it can be dependent on just one age of people or one class of people or one race of people, but it has to, it's going to be a truly successful progressive movement It's going to take a variety of people to be involved. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the things is we wind it down, so we've got about 10 more minutes to go, that we always ask people is if they have, like, a passion thought that they would like to share as a motivating kind of thing. That's one of our little taglines. So if there's something that you want to give as a message to folks that might be listening, that might want to get motivated to get involved in activism or just to get involved in life in general, or you just have, like, some little quote or saying that keeps you motivated every day. If this is your <laughs> time to that. Um, I'm just going to say a few things and, and then I'll, you know, jump off here um, off the line. Uh, what One thing, well, not one thing, a few things. <laughs> one, be a student of history and and be humble about knowing that the work you're entering into when it comes to the betterment of, of the human condition is something that many before you have attempted and that you have not stepped into a barren ground. It is it is ripe and it is full and it is fertile and you need to know um, what has come before you and and respect that um, that history and lean into that history and let it teach you um, and let it show you some things. And that doesn't mean that you can't come up with your own ideas, um, but at least they stand. You know, it's an acknowledgement of what shoulders you stand on. Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that. Um, this work is very hard on the body, it's very hard on the mind, very hard on the spirit, and that one should take care of themselves. And that I'm not interested in seeing folks do this work in such a way that um, there's a conversation that's been going on on Facebook with a lot of the members of Spirit House, which is um, an activist, a you know, cultural alchemist activism organization here in Durham, North Carolina, and they are my sisters and I adore them. Um, And I just need to say that, you know, we've been having a conversation about how it is that we want to arrive to liberation, and we don't want to arrive to liberation shredded to pieces um, or sick um, or just unable to to really um, uh, indulge in the moment of all that work and what it yields. And so we need to think about not just what the work is, but also how we are um, living into that vision even in present day, whether it means taking a breath and meditating or drinking all your water, getting enough sleep, um, going on a walk to work out all the feelings that all this hard work causes in the body, Um, you know, doing some reading and leisure. It doesn't have to be anything exotic. It doesn't have to be, you know, five-star spas. But you do need to take care of yourself um, or else that's another way in which oppression wins. Very true, because oftentimes we do not take care of ourselves in terms of, like, just the basic everyday kind of things in terms of our exercise, in terms of our mental health, in terms of our uh, Mm -hmm. spirituality and all of that kind of stuff. So we get too caught up in the moment of whatever the cause is and everything of that nature. But we definitely have to understand that we as people are definitely uh, people that are connected to all of the elements of us, meaning that we're connected to our mental, our physical, and our spiritual. And if we don't try to keep those things in tune, then uh, we oftentimes will find ourselves 
being unbalanced or in, in a state of imbalance, even though our work might be there and everything. But if an imbalanced person is doing the work after a while, that work will also wind up suffering as well. So you are mm-hmm. absolutely correct. You have to uh, definitely find ways to be totally connected into ourselves. Otherwise, we risk the we run the risk of uh, not doing the best work mm-hmm. that we can do. So mm-hmm. Definitely appreciate you well calling. Said. Definitely appreciate you calling in, uh, Ideal. And uh, we're here every Monday between the hours of seven and nine, and we're oftentimes talking about everything from activism to entertainment to politics of the moment to social justice to all kinds of other important things. And of course, we're airing on all kinds of uh, stations. We're on Blog Talk Radio, but we're also on uh, iHeartRadio, uh, TuneIn, Stitcher, and a variety of other platforms. So any Monday that you feel like and are able to call in. Please feel free to join in the discussion because oftentimes we're just having lively discussions about all kinds of things and trying to keep people informed. And you are definitely one of the people around this community that I look up to in terms of being involved and having been involved for a while. I know that you admire. You are uh, too kind. The, well, I know that you admire some of the work that I've done and some of the work that my mom has done and my dad. And I can say that me myself that the admiration is a two-way street. Thank you. So uh, hopefully you will have a chance to join us on future calls and things of that nature. So, Dean, we got just a few more minutes. I did talk to Gary. He may call us in the next minute, but if he doesn't, that's okay, too. But what are your thoughts for today? It has been a very interesting discussion, man. A lot of good points made by all of our callers, and we thank them for joining us tonight, you know. And um, they they did an outstanding job, man, you know, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of conversations that still need to be had because, you know, we can't just, I guess some people just talk about it. Other people live it. We got to get more people to get involved, to actually put boots on the ground and so we can combat this thing because in this age with everything being so advanced and, we have access, we can spread information in seconds now. So, you know, in order to get it the way we, it should be, it's going to take more individuals to get on board. And, and like, I like the fact that we had a variety of individuals that, that called in. You know, it wasn't just all one race or all one color. Or it, it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of people that are involved whether teaching the youth and bringing them up in a way they should learn because of things that are not given to us. And and then those who have experienced disparate treatment in other ways who decided, you know what, I have to fight too. So all of them are to be commended. We appreciate all of them, and we thank them for calling us here at the voice of the people. That's right. We are definitely becoming a uh, platform for many, and we will continue to be a platform for many. We've got everything from authors to musicians to, of course, activists and others that are talking, whether they're trying to teach folks, as uh, Mr. Wheeler did on one of our previous shows about flying planes, or whether they're helping our youth get involved in activism. There are a lot of folks out there that are working hand-in-hand with our youth as well as across racial and uh, ethnic and um, age barriers and other things of that nature, and they all should be commended for their work and their continued work. Uh, I, for one, am a big supporter of seeing all the great things that they are doing, and I um, continue to keep an eye on what they're doing as uh, they continue to keep an eye on some of the things that we are doing as well. And we're continuing to grow, and uh, we'll continue to grow. So we're uh, just past that half the country mark of about 27 states, still trying to get us to 30 and eventually to all 50 of the states. So we definitely want folks to continue to call in on a regular basis. Don't forget the number is 646-668-8393. Show is almost over, but do write that number down. Keep it in mind. Also keep in mind all the various platforms that we are on because we would love for you to join in the discussions as well because, you know, these are important discussions that need to be had and that we need to continue to learn and thrive to learn from each other and with each other. So definitely uh, hoping that more and more people will learn about what we've got going on and will use this as a platform to learn about things that are going on in the world, be that what's happening in Durham, be that what's happening in uh, Virginia, be that what's happening in New Jersey, whatever the part of the world that you're in. And we don't mind talking about global issues as well. We didn't quite get to it, but it will be a continuing story, I'm sure, 
and I'm sure that we'll be following what's going on with Trump and North Korea, as uh, North Korea apparently launched a fire in the volley of some sort or another across Japan, so they're apparently testing over there with Japan, so I'm sure that we'll be hearing more about that and what's going on on the world front, and we'll have to keep our eyes on that as well, because, you know, anytime you've got two folks, both of them, uh, well, yeah, both of them, in my opinion, as crazy as a loon, over there talking at each other, then we got to keep our eyes on what's going on, because there's no telling what those two will do to each other or with each other, and we're caught in the middle. And, yes, I'm talking about North Korea and its leader and, and our own person. And our own person that claims to be our leader, even though I, for one, am not claiming him as mine. Well, you know what? We're going to continue this again. Are we off next week for Labor Day, or are we on? So, you know, we got about Uh-oh. 10 good seconds. We'll say this. Check us. We'll let you know. We'll see y'all next week. Or maybe the week after. But we appreciate yeah. y'all. God bless and good night. And I'll call Dean and we'll make it happen. Okay. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.